beautiful thing. There you go. Look at that. What an unusual looking camera. Yeah, it's got a, uh, an adapter on it so that I can use a 35mm lens. Right. Why is that important? You'll look way cooler. Yeah. Right, that's important, yeah. yeah. We'd heard that um, you uh, met with Nacho GDC. Mm. Yeah, I met him a few times now. Yeah. Yeah, we had went to... It's, it's so... It, 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 for me, it's like kind of going back in time because, you know, he, he's, he's doing exactly far better than I did, but exactly what I did when I started is that, you know, I had an idea for a game and, you know, I just kind of worked alone with me and a friend and then that was hugely successful and then all of a sudden you go from doing this kind of, you know, person that doesn't know anybody into a person that everybody knows and it's, that is an incredible experience, it really is. It's an amazing experience. Well, that's one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about, mm. since mm. Um, these two experiences do relate to each other in yes, so many ways. Yes, 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 yes. It's funny, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> yeah. And and how did that change things for you when that happened? I mean, it changed everything, you know. For me, I mean, I, you know, it was just, I was just this bloke who smoked a lot of cigarettes and ate a lot of pizzas and drank a lot of coke and, like, coding and that was it that's how, what defined me i wasn't i didn't define myself as a as a programmer even or a designer or a, in the games industry i was just someone that's all i that's what i did and then just working on this thing which then ended up being this massive global success was was an incredible surprise i mean it was it was an unbelievable surprise you know to go from nothing to some to something significant in the space of a few weeks really after the launch of the game was astounding it really was and uh, there were so many surprises there's so many things that you'd never predict that were like like for example you know like notch at at at, at, at gdc was you know the thought that publishers would want to have a dinner with me we you know what you know, the fact when I, w when I started, it was in this tiny office, ti it wasn't an office really, it was a room over this f flat where this old, this old woman lived and she hadn't left the house for like 10 years. And so you had to creep up the stairs to get to my room because if you woke her up, she used to come out and attack people with a broom. And there was one point after we'd launched the game where the the president of one of the biggest companies in the world called Saito, this Japanese company, had flown all the way over to meet with me. <laughs> and he was <laughs> climbing up the stairs, you know, th obviously thinking, where the hell am I? And this old woman appeared with a broom and beat him out of the office. <laughs> and then he, he had to go to a public phone box, and because there's no mobile phone then, and he phoned me up and said, Oh, we cannot get into your office. There is our strange woman. <laughs> we had to get there. You know, so many things like that, and you know, just bringing people in. And then the other strange thing is that everybody thought that this was a, a plan of mine. You know, that I had some great design that that this game populace would turn into something else, and I knew exactly what was going to happen next. I didn't have any plans at all. I was just. You know, I'd just done a game that I liked to play, and um, you know that was that was an incredible experience, really. Yeah. Do you ever uh, reminisce for those times? Do you wish you could go back to uh, that space where you could develop out of the public eye and work on games that, without having all the the pressure of the media on mm. top of it as well? Yes, I mean definitely. I mean, I definitely the thought of locking herself away and working on something without the burden of of not not only the burden of the press but the burden of publishers and you know just where we're sitting at the moment is in a company owned by Microsoft and Microsoft you know they kind of need to know what they're spending their money on and they need to know regularly what they're spending their money on and that 
you've got to completely understand that, but that is an incredible burden. Because you, what you desperately want to do is innovate and experiment and play with stuff. And when someone says to you, well, you've got you know, 45 days, three hours and two minutes to do that experimentation in, it, that's not how my mind works, or I think that the creative process works. It, it's not something that's easy to schedule up. Now, um, Marcus has made a very strong commitment to just um, keeping mm. his company small and just attempting to work on games internally. Um, what was it like for you having to sort of work with larger publishers and things mm. as time went by? Would you have preferred to have stayed in a small space? I mean, the, 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 there was a, the, the perfect size mm. to work is one. Mm. That is the per and every time you add a one to a one and then a one to a two, it becomes less perfect. And um, whilst I think we all want to stay small and we want to stay in control and we want to stop the world looking in, it's very, 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 very hard to do so. There's always the another reason, there's another opportunity that you'd have to miss and that is the big, big challenge to anybody to any small developer, you know, I think every small developer, unless they want to rule the world, wants to stay small, but it's incredibly difficult. And I don't know many, many um, software houses that have managed to, to stay really small. I mean, I think the perfect size for me is once you reach over 20 people, that's when it gets really tough. Because then you need to have another layer of people to manage the people that are there and when you can all fit in one office and you can stick your head up and say oh what's that you're working on or you know look at this everybody that's a perfect size but once you get over that it's really really tough so I, if I was doing it all again I would say exactly what Marcus is saying I would say I'm going to stay small but I bet you within two three years um, after a successful game you be at you'd be hitting that 20 person barrier. What do you think some of the challenges he's going to face over the next coming years are? Well, the, 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 first, thing, the first big challenge, the challenge of success, is the, and the challenge of expectations, and is that when you're the new kid on the block, no one has formed any expectations from you whatsoever. And then when you, 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 you kind of have exceeded, way exceeded people's expectations, asking someone to do that again is really tough. Um, and just staying clear with why you're doing something and what you're doing it for and who you're doing it for. And that was very obvious that what Minecraft was, was his idea. It wasn't someone else's idea. It wasn't, you know, 10 people meeting in a room and coming up with 10 more ideas and designed by committee it was his idea and if he sticks with that then I think that you know that that's all going to be fine that on top of once you've got something like Minecraft that's making a lot of money a lot of people start feeding in on that you know there's a lot of people that depend on that money uh, and you know that becomes enormously challenging as well um, I think you've got to keep yourself fresh you know I found when I designed Populous originally, you know, there was the Peter Molyneux before, and then my whole life just changed radically, you know, from everything about my life, from where I lived to the car I drove to the food I ate to the people I mixed with, just changed in the space of a few months. And that changed me. And, you know, that, you know, it sounds very zen, but you know, living with yourself and understanding who you're becoming because everything's changed around you is, is really key. And then on top of that, is as he is adding more people in, you know, it will be at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, you know, working with those people, making those people your, you know, your friends, it, it, you know, that is challenging as well. But all of those are an aside because the great thing is what I've seen him do is making really smart, really wonderful incremental changes to what was a great game at the start 
and now becoming a brilliant game um, as you go through that. Then have you noticed within the industry any sort of, um, how much attention are they paying to Minecraft? Have uh, people within the company sort of looked at it and are they trying to take any lessons from it or is it just a curiosity? Well, I, at the very moment I first saw Minecraft, the very second I first saw it, it was like a, it was like, you know, the world changed for me a little bit, you know, because I really truly believe there's in the past, you know, five to ten years there's been some brilliant moments in gaming and Minecraft is definitely one of them. And <coughs> what I did, immediately I went round to everyone and said, oh, you've got to go and play Minecraft, you've got to look at this game. And a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues, and then, you know, Lionhead and Microsoft, and they looked at it and some people looked at it and said, oh, this is ridiculous, where's the tutorial, where's the challenges, where's the, you know, there's this list of, of game must-haves, which are almost like a lot of games are designed like this, well, you know, you've got to have pillars, you've got to have this kind of a formula which people use. And Minecraft broke every single one of those formulas. And I can remember talking to certain individuals which were responsible for, you know, looking at interesting trends in, in, in the industry, and they were saying, oh, Minecraft, that, right? It, it, it's just a tech demo. You know, no one's ever going to play it. You like it, Peter, because you're a, yeah, this weird designer bloke. And I said, no, 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 look, why? The reason that this works is because it breaks all those, all those things that we've th thought of as foundation stones. Because it breaks those, it's so fresh and new and different. Because it allows people to do what they want rather than what a designer wants them to do. It's fresh, new and different. And it took a while, and it was only it was only when, and it so often happens in the world, it's only when Minecraft, the, well, actually, I'll tell you when it was, is when the kids of the people who had just said those statements had come to them and said, hey, Dad, I really love Minecraft, you know, can I, can I buy it? That they realized that something was happening. That they realized that this game, Minecraft, had existed had become successful without a single piece of marketing. It had become successful without a publisher. It had become successful without, you know, without challenges and tutorials and, and retail boxes. And that's when they, I think everyone then turned around and said, uh oh, we just feel a little bit like a dinosaur, you know, a, a, a dinosaur that's about to die out. And that's really, you know, I, maybe I'm over, overthinking this. But that's really what this points to, is just how conventional game studios, how complacent they were with the games that they were making. And it need, we need, this industry desperately needs things like Minecraft to come along and say, slap us around the face and say, hang on a second, all those things that you thought were absolutely certain in your life, they're not certain anymore. And that's what it is. So there was a lot of been a lot of talk and a lot of meetings and a lot of demos a lot of a lot of a, a lot of people sort of turning up why does it work and everything like that it's, it's 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 just very very funny to see i feel proud that i you know i i was totally driven by one sole thing which was my enjoyment of the game now it's um not only the game itself, but the way the game is developed, with mm. Marcus being so communicative to fans, yes, and yes, being so incredibly open, that also seems completely against what the game industry, how it traditionally handles itself. Absolutely. I mean, one of the goal, you know, one of the problems you've got sitting in this studio, you, you're not allowed through that door over there. You know, it's totally secret. We've got to keep every one of our game design secret, and and then there's this this idea of, oh, we'll it will it will do this thing called shock and awe. We'll show the game we're making when it's almost finished and we'll shock the, awe, the world and they'll all be awestruck with the world. What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. Is that, you know, I've always, and at the moment this is hugely frustrating for me, is I have always been a massive fan of telling people 10 minutes after I thought of an idea, the idea of working on and then telling them all the time. And that's what Marcus has done. Rather than waiting for the final release, he released the alpha. Now, the paranoia of most people in the industry would, would totally reject that idea. You know, they would say, no, no, keep it secret, keep it under the bonnet, get everything worked out, and then release it. No, 
I think Marcus proves that you don't have to do that, that the world won't come along and steal your idea and you know, you'll be begging on the streets in a pauper within, within 10 minutes. And I've always been an absolute believer, ideas are cheap. I'll t I could tell you in a second what the idea of the next game I'm working on. It doesn't make any difference at all. Nothing bad's going to happen. The skill, the brilliance, is the implementation. It's taking an idea from something that's written on a piece of paper and implementing it in a way that is just wonderful and delightful and enjoyable. That's where the real skill is. And part, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound you're going to think, oh, well, he's only saying this because we're sitting interviewing about Minecraft. But because of Minecraft, I think it has changed my view of what I do on a day to day basis. You know, I now have started sitting down and doing what I think I'm actually should be good at, and that is designing games and going back and tr fiddling with numbers and doing a bit of coding. And that's what I'm doing. And I've, I think a lot of that is because. What I realized is, you know, designing, talking about, and experimenting is at the heart of what Minecraft is. No, it, it seems like Minecraft is almost, um, in a way, the exact opposite, but spiritually similar to games that you've developed in the past. Mm. Whereas it's like a vibrant, open world, mm. but instead of being a omnipotent kind yes. of character, yeah, you you're are down there, yeah. the yeah. one sole person, and yeah. the effect that you have on the landscape is solely driven by yourself. Mm, mm. You really have to do everything on your own. Yeah, I mean, I'd love, I love the, uh, I love the, well, there's so many things I love about Minecraft. One of the things I absolutely adore is the idea that this is an almost limitless world, that it's full of variation, differences, and a mixture of simulation and and discovery, which I absolutely, which I've been trying to sort of give to people with you know games like you know Populous and you know, Power Monger and and Dungeon Keeper and 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 Black and White, you know that's that was a, what the was the heart of that experience. I think it's brilliant to put it in first person. I think you feel connected to all what to the world in a way that being a god never makes you feel connected to the world. I think the fact in god games you kind of own the world isn't as important as owning your own house. And that, you know, that idea of building and creating and almost modding as part of the game experience is why it's far better than a, a, god, a god game and a game that I've done, for sure. You, uh, no. <laughs> no, for sure. It's just fact. It's fact. It's not an emotional statement. It's a fact. Are you? Um, I don't know. Are you a bit? Um, had you wished that you had thought of something like Minecraft? Is it like? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't wish I'd thought of something like Minecraft. I wish I had. I wish I was in a position that I could have experimented with something like Minecraft. Whether I would have got to it in the same way, I'm not sure. I, I, but I do think, you know, I envy that time that Marcus had. I mean, I totally respect his bravery of giving up his job and just saying, you know, I'm going to do it. And, you know, it's kind of what I did. And, you know, it reminds me of how wonderful those days are. Also terrifying, let's not, you know, let's not make any bones about it, is that, you know, what I did with Populous and I bet what Marcus did with, with Minecraft is, is a frightening experience because you, you know, you're just saying, look, I'm going to do what I want to do, not what someone tells me to do. And that, that is quite scary. But, um, you know, I, in, in a way, I, you know, I crave that innovation. Yeah, <coughs> innovation of time. I think it tends to be that pressure that, um, people are under that inspires some of the greatest creation. Mm. And um, when there's too much of a, a safety net built up around you, that might stifle yeah. creativity. For sure. Degree. I think that's right. I mean, I think that a lot of creativity is born out of desperation. And some that desperation can come from a whole 
slew of things. It can come from, you know, publishers threatening to kill your project, and it can come from yourself saying, you know, I just don't believe I'll ever be able to do anything. And you can, but that desperation is motivates you and drives you on. And I think there as well as is that you get almost a confidence from being in a position where you need to fight to achieve something. It gives you a confidence. You know, when you get something working and it does give you that confidence. But you're right, the worst thing for creativity is a comfortable, happy, pleasant life. It's it's terrible. It just it's, it's like it's like the valium to creativity. It's just it just blurs all, all those sharp edges. Now, you you're saying that you're you're starting to think about these things differently more. Mm. And you're trying to get more mm. deeply involved into the process. Mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you have to fight for? Um. Amazing. Somewhat, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult for, you know, to, for someone like myself, I think, because you need to, people define you in different ways. And, you know, they, def they you know, over the last few years, they define me as being someone who kind of guided things, right, as opposed to design things. And when you kind going to wake up one morning and say, right, I'm not going to be this anymore, I'm going to be that again. It's difficult. It's difficult for people to kind of adjust around that, mm. and um, I, you know we'll have to see because the, the, at the moment you know I'm working on something which is, which is, you know still being experimented with, and I think the proof really at the end how successful that me transitioning from one place to another place is will be evidenced by what you know I make. So we'll have to see. Obviously, I t totally believe what I'm working on is going to be, you know, some of the best things I've ever done in my life. I mean, it, it feels that that's where I feel like I am at the moment. Incidentally, this is why I need to have a few hours between design and interviewing because this is uh, otherwise I'm just way too excited about what I'm doing, and then I get in trouble about saying things like it's going to be the greatest game ever and yeah, you know, stuff like that. You know. Got to stick to the norm of what people expect from you. Yeah, I mean, you have to. Well, I think we, you know, when I, I've been around as long as I am, and I, I'm such an awful person in front of the camera because I'm just too. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a great PR person where I'm not thinking, oh God, I can't say this, I can't say this, I can't say this. It just sort of comes out of my mouth, and I get in terrible trouble. Which is for that. Yeah. We can stick to Minecraft here. Yeah, exactly. Avoid yeah, problems. let's do it. It's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it is like, it is, in a way, a social Lego. When Lego used to be a creative toy, which I don't think it is so much anymore because it's much more prescriptive. It's really interesting how Lego at the moment is like traditional games design. It's buy the box, open the box, turn to the instruction sheet, make the model, stick it on the shelf, buy the next box. That's exactly like traditional game design, you know, buy the game, go through the challenges, finish the challenges, stick it on the shelf, buy the next game. Where Lego used to be just a big box of bricks and you used to take the bricks, pour them on the carpet and then make stuff. And that's exactly what Minecraft is. There was no instruction booklet. You didn't have need an instruction book on how to put two bricks together. Yeah. Yeah, it's what you see in Minecraft is that although there's no story or anything that's specifically guiding a person through the mm. game, each player tends to make their own story and yes. have their own experiences. Yes, yes. Do you think that um, is that the direction that gaming is, is moving in? Or after all this time where games yeah. have become so much like movies, are they yeah. gonna start going in the opposite yeah. direction? I I think it just shows you how diverse gaming is. I don't think that Minecraft will replace games. I think it will inspire a change in games. But some times I love to be given challenges, you know, and those challenges to be sequential. I just, you know, I love it. Just as I love watching some television programs which have a structure to it and characters to it, fine. But what 
absolutely is so fascinating about gaming over the last 10 years is how incredibly diverse it can be. From, you know, the most creative experiences to the most, most led experiences, it just goes to show that we really are still at the, the birth of a new form of entertainment. And we've been saying that for like 20 years, but really now it's really properly happening. And when you've got, you know, games like the Zynga games and the mobile games and the, you know, traditional AAA games and Minecraft, and they're all existing and living together and they're all entertaining us. You know, they're entertaining some people who've never played computer games before, entertaining some people that play, like myself, that play, you know, every computer game there is. I think it just shows you what wonderful diversity there is. What is it about the game that makes people feel so strongly about it? Why does it have such a strong emotional connection? I think because it, 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 there's some very fundamental psychological elements to it, like exploring and feeling lost. You know, when you think about it, human beings have to have a home, they have to have a base. They have to have the security of knowing where they can close the door. And that very clear game mechanic of everything's safe by day, everything's scary by night, is just feeds into, you know, this is how human beings used to run their life in prehistoric times. You know, we'd run around a hunt during the day and lock ourselves in a cave at night. That is a, you know, that's built into our DNA. And in that sense, the, there's a few of those layers on that. There's, there's also, it really promotes envy. If there's no cheating, it is, you know, ooh, that's, this chest is, it's, and it's very interesting in how it almost promotes the seven deadly sins. You know, you open someone else's chest in their house, you know it's their house because it's got a sign outside and it's full of diamonds. Wow, he's so rich, it doesn't matter if I take one or two. Hey, well, hell, I'll take the whole lot, you know. You know, that's, you know, that's envy. And, you know, it, 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 there's so many interesting psychological things that we, as you say, we make our own stories up. We, we instill our own morals in there. There's nothing in there that says that is right or wrong. It's just allowable. So um, you mentioned something that made us think about a story that Marcus was telling us because mm. um, with all the awards that he won at GDC and all the attention he was getting, he said he felt a bit like an imposter. Yes. And yeah, I can. He yeah. was afraid someone was going to find him out. Yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've abso I still feel that today. Yeah. Is that, I mean, I absolutely felt I mean, for years, well, I still feel like an imposter, like uh, it shouldn't be happening to me or someone's going to turn around and say, aha, but no, no, that can't work because of this. You know, I was going to be found out. I think it is. And when you, I think when you create something from nothing, as he's done, then you are going to feel like that. You know, how often do you hear of directors that are ashamed of the films that they've done, and artists that don't like the pictures they make, and musicians who don't think a song that they've made is, is, is great? Because I think the act of creation is the act of self-doubt, and there is no award, there is no number of sales, there is no review score that can ever meet that expectation in your mind that you've created something that's perfect because there is no such a concept of, as, perfe as perfection. So I think you do tend to feel like an imposter, yeah. yeah. We were going to ask if there was a point where that feeling had gone away. No. But, no. <laughs> no, in fact, it's quite the reverse, is that, the, is that you know, I feel ashamed. I, ashamed of what I've done with the games that I've made and the opportunities that I've squandered and the, the successes that I should have had. And, you know, I think going back, there were, you know, very good and justifiable reasons why there's some, you know, things wouldn't work. But, you know, in my last 20 years of career or 25 years of career of looking at it, the reasons why something shouldn't have worked, have got less and less and less, and that should have increased the reasons why something should work. And I still, and I've said this in the press and people don't 
you know, think they think it's spin or rubbish or bullshit or whatever, but it's true. So I still really believe that I have got one great game, you know, inside one great game idea and one great game idea that I can inspire a team to turn into a real idea in me. And, you know, I still feel I'm scrabbling and to try and get to that. That's, uh, that's absolutely true. So if not feels like that today, that'll get worse. It won't get better. Why games? Why, why care so well, much about games? Well, for me, I mean, I think there was something very incredible about a computer game. It, it, it's a combination of allowing people to immerse themselves in a world which isn't this world, which allows them to forget about the world around them, but also allows them to be themselves. And that no other form of entertainment really allows that, is that to be yourself, to be who you are, not who somebody else wants you to be, is you know, an incredible thing, an amazing thing. And it is the future, I think, a real future of what computer entertainment should be, is being able to you be yourself, whoever you want to be. You can see that in the games that I've been made. Is you give people the choice to, and the freedom to be who they want to be. So I think there's an incredible future in that. And an even more exciting future when you just don't apply that logic to you, but you apply it to you and your friends and your community. And you know, I think there's an incredible future for that. I just feel that computer games and computer entertainment is an incredible place to be because it is going to change fundamentally all over again in the next 10 years and will continue to do so yeah because it's such a wonderful adopter of what the world is today okay great sorry about the okay. coffee no it's fine yeah. i'm sorry to do that yeah, yeah, it's just I, I, got a, I had a cold, and then I talk too much and don't breathe enough, <laughs> and that's what happens. Well, yeah, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with Not us. At all. It's absolutely